Hello and welcome to this virtual public seminar featuring JD Schnepf on ecological crisis and the rise of drone humanitarianism. Uh, my name is Michael Richardson and I'm a senior research fellow in the School of the Arts and Media at UNSW and co-director of the Media Futures Hub, which is hosting this event. I'd like to begin today's talk by um, offering an acknowledgement of country. I'm coming to you from the lands of the Bedigal people of the Eora Nation, unceded um, territory. Um, and I want to extend uh, my respect to elders past, present and emerging. The struggle for justice for Indigenous uh, peoples here in, here in the country we now call Australia and around the world uh, continues. Um, this is the fourth of six seminars on the theme of drone futures. Drones are crucial to the future of war, but also of everything from policing to agriculture to conservation. Drones are reshaping how the world is perceived, how people are governed, and how power is enacted and resisted. By showcasing scholarship from multiple disciplines, this seminar series aims to spark new connections and stimulate debate about how to build more just drone futures. This seminar series is hosted by the Media Futures Hub and funded by an Australian Research Council Discovery Early Career Researcher Award that I hold for a project about drones and witnessing in war and culture. If you'd like to know more about that project or to see the upcoming drone futures seminars, you'll find a link below the video if you click show more on YouTube. It's an exciting lineup. And you can also read about the symposium on drone cultures that will follow these seminars in December. Today, we're going to hear from JD Schnepf, assistant professor, newly assistant professor of American studies at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Jen's research focuses on the literature and culture of the US security state, surveillance technologies, extractive infrastructures, and the war on terror. Jen is currently working on a book project that traces the relationships between militarized drones that maintain US imperialism overseas and cultural representations of femininity and domesticity at home, which sounds really fantastic. And based on her work to date, will surely make an important contribution to this emerging field of drone studies. Um, Jen and I have been friends on Twitter for a while now, and uh, we met earlier this year in um, Sheffield, which now feels, Sheffield, the UK, which now feels like several years ago, um, all of a sudden. And we've been talking about connecting in the US uh, sometime over, over the North American summer um, and, and our winter, but uh, alas, this virtual uh, event will have to do um, for now. Um, one of the reasons that I'm really interested in Jen and her work is that, um, like me, she has a, uh, her original training is in um, literature. Um, and so um, she approaches some of these questions in, on drones in ways that are both different to how I would, but also familiar in, in some of her tendencies and, and lines of inquiry. Um, before I hand, it over, hand over to Jen, though, um, I'll just describe the format. I'm sure some of you who are uh, here today have been to a few of these already, but um, so bear with me if you've heard this a couple of times before. So to keep the event as widely ex accessible as possible and limit the risk of tech issues, you're all on YouTube rather than in this Zoom call. Um, on YouTube, you've got access to the chat, which is moderated by Madeline Weber, a PhD candidate at UNSW, who's working with me on this drones project. Madeline will be following along and diving into the chat and she'll feed your comments and questions into the Zoom. So while this is a little less intimate than us all being in the same virtual room, we're hoping it helps the discussion flow smoothly. And it also means you can chat during the talk without disturbing anyone. Um, I'll also note that my internet connection is uh, a bit choppy at the moment. Um, so uh, forgive any issues um, on, on, as a result of that. And now, uh, without further ado, uh, Jen Schnepf on ecological crisis and the rise of drone humanitarianism. Jen, you're welcome to share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay, um, thank you um, so much, Michael. Uh, I wanted to say, um, first of all, um, thank you for the invitation to speak here today. Um, 
I've been an avid watcher of the seminar series so far, so I'm really happy to be a part of this. Um, I also want to thank Madeline and Kara for all the labor you're putting into this project behind the scenes um, to make the series possible. And uh, thanks to everyone who's tuning in today. Um, finally, uh, I wanted to thank uh, the earlier speakers, uh, Ronak and Antoine, um, Jairus and Kate, uh, for really phenomenal presentations that I've been thinking about over the past uh, month or so. Um, in fact, I was so taken by uh, one of the final points that Kate made at the end of her talk um, and the way that it dovetails with my own work on drone humanitarianism uh, that I thought I would start my talk by returning us uh, to the place where she left off. Um, and so if you missed that talk, obviously you can uh, catch that on the YouTube channel because I know it's posted there. Um, so to begin. <laughs> um, so Kate Chandler first uh, related to us uh, the plot of what she called a bad movie. Um, this is Kingsman, uh, The Gold Circle um, from 2017. Um, what's relevant for you to know if you haven't watched it um, is that this character on your screen, Poppy Adams, is the head of a global drug cartel. Poppy puts a toxin in her drugs that slowly paralyzes her consumers. We see the reach of her global distribution network as it physically penetrates the nervous systems of the Princess of Sweden, an undercover agent at a Kentucky bourbon distillery, a young man in London, and the US Secretary of State. The narrative of the film comes to a conclusion uh, in the following way, and these are Chandler's words. Um, she says the vaccine, the antidote, is distributed worldwide by an amazing fleet of flying drones. I uh, screen captured this image for you. So you can see um, a blurry photo of uh, drones passing by uh, the Statue of Liberty um, and the golden liquid is uh, the anecdote to this um, uh, deadly um, toxin. Uh, so Chandler says, uh, in this image, we have the problems of the world sort of being magically solved through a fleet of mechanical drones that will quickly right all the wrongs that have happened and are part of our political and ethical practices. Um, so very quickly, you can see how in the case of this film, we have a global humanitarian disaster, um, a familiar one. Um, the welfare of millions of human lives are at stake. And the solution here um, that's been posed is that uh, the tech that will save us um, is the drone. Um, so I do think at least in this film, there's a bit of a, a tongue in cheek framing going on that's a bit interesting. Um, again, another uh, capture, uh, screen capture from the film. Um, in the first place, I think, um, as if to interrupt the audience from cheering on this idea of the humanitarian drone, um, they're branded with the name of the plot's villain. And there you can see uh, Poppy um, mentioned on the side of the drone. Um, and second, um, you can see in uh, the laptop that uh, Poppy uses, uh, the same monster corporation that thrives on the transportation and logistics of global capitalism to distribute um, drugs around the world. Um, is now uh, extending its reach once again into the deepest biological recesses of human life. In other words, uh, here the film's visualization of the roots and targets of global capitalism that led to the impending mass death reveals itself a second time, where captive consumers are now the targets of relief for vaccine. So what I mean to suggest, uh, I think, is that uh, Poppy's distribution empire uh, in this film actually encourages us to see drones from an infrastructural perspective. Uh, and this helps us see their intractable entanglements with global capital and the villains that profit off of it, uh, rather than as autonomous technological agents uh, doing good deeds on their own. Um, in this case, good deeds being the uh, dispensation of life. So this sort of infrastructural approach to uh, humanitarian drones 
um, is one I'm going to be taking today. Uh, this work, um, this approach, sorry, is indebted to the work of Lisa Parks um, and Nicole um, Sterosielski for pointing out the complex materialities of media infrastructures um, that distribute digital content. So um, this has been a, a turn from um, digital content itself, right, to the um, uh, infrastructures that distribute signal um, and determine its form. So adopting an infrastructural disposition will shift our focus um, to the materialities of signal distribution and its inseparability from the biophysical environment. Um, as I'm going to suggest today, uh, this sort of approach, I hope, will make uh, help us make sense of real world drones uh, framed as technologies that save lives. Um, in the example that's on your screen right now, uh, it's important to know, right, that rather than seek out local public solutions, in this case, um, a government contracted an Australian uh, commercial drone company called Swoop Aero um, in what appears to be yet another kind of um, new intervention between doctor and patient made by a private company that will in turn reap the benefits of that. Um, so for all these reasons, uh, the words that uh, Chandler left us with last time are going to serve uh, as the epigraph for my talk today. Um, and I've, I've done my best to reproduce that on the screen in front of you. So she says, I would like to propose an alternative image. We don't need a fleet of drones that's going to fix everything. We need human actions to take back the idea of the machine and machine futures, and instead think about that as the ways we can act and transform. So instead of being acted upon by the drone, the drone is actually something that is acted upon by human hands and if we want to use them to save people, this is already a problematic set of rhetorics. But that needs to be front and center, that the drone doesn't do the saving. Rather, it is the ways in which the drone provides a medium for human relationality. And through those forms of relating to one another, that maybe we could come up with something that might be more just. Um, so thank you to Kate for that. <laughs> In my talk today, I'm going to consider the EcoDrone's emergent status uh, as a humanitarian technology in the way I've laid out, um, but here in the context of environmental disaster relief efforts. So to do this, I'm going to introduce you to four key points uh, regarding the kinds of um, situations that I think get produced when we look at the ways in which domestic consumer drones get deployed um, in ecological crises. Uh, and in particular, I'm looking at flood aftermaths in um, Southern United States, like uh, Texas, Louisiana, and North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So four points uh, that I want to uh, impart to you today. Uh, the first is that better sensing technologies will not save lives. What I mean by this is that we need to look um, as well at the broader public funding of infrastructure, um, of search and rescue labor, of roadways, um, the funding of levees. Uh, this is also to say that it's important to think of drone technologies as large scale media infrastructures rather than as isolated or disconnected objects. Uh, number two, the figure of the heroic drone operator um, I think this is what Inderpal Grewal um, would call an exceptional citizen, a figure who voluntarily does the security work of the state when the state uh, retreats from that civic obligation. Um, there was a little bit of back and forth on this um, with my, my editors for uh, the piece that I'm sharing with you today, um, with Janet Walker and Lisa Parks, um, because it's important um, we recognize to be both critical of, of this figure of the heroic drone operator and at the same time recognize that the position um, has opened up in the first place because of a failing welfare state. So um, we didn't want this to be a condemnation of um, individual volunteers, but at the same time allow a space to be critical of the heroic drone operator as a figure um, that emerges in the discourse. Um, and number three, um, citizen sensing of ecological disaster by drone uh, can undermine um, some of our most uh, pernicious drone myths. 
And number four, um, the humanitarian drone discourse is a formation of imperialism. Uh, and I think here uh, I will head off the inevitable questions that I might get. Um, uh, is there such thing as a good drone? Uh, I've got that before. Um, by just sort of saying that I um, think that to accept the premise of that, that question would be to concede to a definition of what um, humanitarian drones are that I want to resist. Um, so again, looking in infrastructural terms, we cannot disentangle this technology from how it's made, uh, who has access to it, what kind of power they hold, and how the drone is further entrenching and consolidating that power. And as I'll show today, what kind of labor and affects uh, that power compels drones to extract from humans. Um, so uh, I'm going to sort of resist the good bad categorization, um, but rather uh, critique the way that it um, gets deployed in, in the discourses we're gonna be looking at today. Um, okay, so part one, better sensing technologies will not save lives. Drone social media makes flood rescue happen in real time. Um, this is the headline of a CNN news item that was first published um, back in October of 2016. Um, according to the story, a man named Quavis Hart of Fayetteville, um, North Carolina, uh, flew his consumer drone over homes engulfed by floodwaters near Hope Springs um, in order to take aerial photographs. Uh, Hart then uploaded the image to Instagram. Uh, that's what you see in front of you. So just the tops of the houses um, showing up uh, over the muddy waters. Uh, he linked this shot to Twitter and shortly thereafter, he was contacted on Twitter by a stranger in Texas named uh, Craig Williams. Um, the Twitter uh, exchange is up for you on the screen. So this is um, uh, Crypto Quavo is Quavo Hart and Craig Williams, um, recognizing it's his brother's house in the response. Um, and you can see this, this exchange playing out on um, social media. So as it turns out, William's brother, Chris, uh, had been stranded in his attic for 14 hours in, in that previous image. One of those um, rooftops was his. Uh, and this Instagram post was the first time that Chris saw the danger that his brother, sorry, the da uh, Craig saw the danger that his brother was in. Um, despite repeated efforts to contact government agencies to rescue Chris, no one picked up Craig's calls. As he remembered it, we called local emergency services, we called the fire department, and nothing would go through. So Craig Williams appealed directly to Hart, who used his drone to attract the attention of a passing um, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency um, boat uh, to get, Chris home, get to Chris's home. And according to Hart, they wouldn't have checked the house had I not distracted them with my drone. So in the newspaper story that I just showed you, uh, this was summed up as a drone operator, the perseverance of family and the cross country reach of social media. In a straightforward way, we can see how the story underscores the humanitarian potential of putting new media technologies in the hands of private citizens to combat the human tragedy that accompanies environmental disaster. What makes the tale of Chris's rescue from the attic particularly interesting, however, is not only that it casts citizen drone rescue in heroic terms, but also that it naturalizes and it anticipates the outsourcing of disaster relief to private actors. In dwelling on the saga of missed connections, sheer coincidences that the rescue depends upon, the news story inadvertently highlights the absence of reliable public emergency services. At the same time, it promulgates the promise of a spontaneous media network um, that links strangers to one another. Quavis Hart becomes representative of the expectation that US citizens can commandeer media assemblages to assume the work of public welfare in times of peril, effectively transforming into privatized agents of post-disaster search and rescue missions in the process. <clears throat> so 
In the wake of natural disasters, such as hurricanes, floods, and fires, social media platforms are awash with amateur photos and videos that bring the immediacy of local devastation to millions of viewers across the globe. We can classify the capture and circulation of such images as ecological surveillance or eco-sensing by private citizens, insofar as this labor often is a non-professional, but nonetheless near instantaneous visual record of an environmental catastrophe. Facilitated by consumer electronics, such as cell phones and consumer drones, the practice of citizen eco-sensing approximates professional methods of documentation taken up by corporations, scientific bodies, and government agencies in recent years. For advocates of ecological surveillance, professional forms of eco-sensing promise to ensconce the planet within an expanding web of instrumentation, effectively reimagining the earth as a self-reporting patient who communicates its injuries and facilitates its healing um, through both human and non-human corrective measures. Environmental media scholar uh, Jennifer Gabris has described these surveillance practices as the sensorization of the environment. Um, that is the deployment of remote sensing technologies in the service of environmental monitoring, um, a practice that is computational, often networked, frequently automated and becoming um, all the more uh, ubiquitous. These practices can include putting to work any number of sensing technologies, um, be they terrestrial, um, aerial or both. Um, so my focus today will be on the aerial. Uh, recently, ecologists and con conservation biologists have expanded uh, their aerial environmental sensing resources by bringing unmanned aerial systems or drones into the fold of digital sensing technologies. Um, with their unique mobility, eco drones work alongside satellites, um, conventional uh, static uh, web cameras as yet another camera based mode of sensing the environment. The drone sensing capacities come to the fore, for example, uh, in reports recounting the adoption of the eco drone as a life saving instrument intervening in environmental crisis, um, in the environmental crisis of species extinction. Uh, the recruitment of this technology um, in animal conservation efforts is evidenced in the sheer number of global scientific projects that deploy these aerial systems. Um, so within the US, uh, there are reports of uh, eco drones uh, rehabilitating um, the pygmy rabbit population uh, in Idaho. Um, outside the US, and here on your screen, uh, you have a sort of depiction of what I think is the most popular uh, narrative that we're getting these days about um, the relationship between uh, drones and animal conservation. Um, uh, and that is eco drones as guards to the lives of charismatic megafauna. Um, in the Luanda National Park in Malawi, for instance, trained operators deploy uh, thermal cameras uh, affixed to bat hawk drones to spot potential poachers who hunt protected uh, elephants and rhinoceros. Um, and I'll just say that a lot of those uh, projects are um, coming from uh, US private US drone companies. So um, once again, the privatization is entering by way of the uh, drone. So the eco drone has also revolutionized the process of visually monitoring the dynamic environmental conditions that are characteristic of natural disasters. When flying over melting ice sheets in Greenland, monitoring lava flows in Hawaii, or capturing infrared images of active fires in Australia, the eco drone's ability to traverse the planet's most inhospitable environments has ushered in an unprecedented perspective of the non-human world, and in doing so has helped to shape the way we visualize environmental change in the 21st century. Proponents of the turn to aerial sensing technology predict that this drive to survey all aspects of the environment will not only transform the public's environmental imagination, but will hasten the mobilization of humanitarian aid um, in future environmental disasters. In the case of humanitarian crises precipitated by floods, um, 
Gabrice, for example, has stated that the planetary self-reporting uh, through sensors could effectively be used to signal flood alerts to enable rapid responses to disaster situations. This means, um, and this is her quote, that floods can be instantly reported to ensure intelligent and immediate environmental management. The claim that the near instantaneous speed at which information travels through digital networks will inevitably lead to similarly rapid or immediate environmental management deserves careful scrutiny. Um, especially given that it elides the discrepancy between disaster reporting and sensing on the one hand and disaster management on the other. Just as the story of uh, Quavis and Craig at the beginning of my talk illustrated, the drone operator's promise of help did not entail immediate rescue. In fact, high-tech eco-sensing in disaster conditions reveals a sharp discrepancy between the fact of sensing and the amelioration of human devastation. So part two, the heroic drone operator does unpaid care labor once performed by the state. So I've been suggesting that the figures of the post-disaster eco drone and its pilot are indices of the failed public infrastructure of the neoliberal state. And yet, um, as the news report I started with illustrated, stories of post-disaster flooding tout the privatized humanitarian drone as an indispensable instrument for the industrious citizen who flies it into action. The privatization of citizen rescues in the aftermath of disaster has given rise to the emergent figure of the heroic drone operator. This recreational flyer's combination of privately honed piloting skills and humanitarian impulse is conscripted as a form of flexible work, uh, volunteered on behalf of the public good in times of ecological crisis. Consumer drone rescues constitute just the latest iteration of a long-standing practice of emergency assistance via private recreation vehicle in the Southern United States. For instance, after Hurricane Katrina, stories of rescue by exceptional citizens outfitted with pickup trucks and fishing boats uh, became regular, um, a, a regular feature of disaster reporting. Um, and this is uh, the website for the Cajun Navy, which maybe you've heard of. Um, the stories that circulated about the Cajun Navy described as a volunteer online grassroots effort um, is that that is founded on the realization that large government agencies aren't quick moving. Um, we're particularly uh, fast to expound on the phenomenon of crossing state lines to selflessly help fellow citizens in danger. Um, I'll just say, uh, if you look at the, um, the writing in the lower left-hand corner for requesting a rescue, you can see some of this tension between um, state actors and private actors. So. Um, the Cajun Navy asking people to please first call 911, um, that we're doing our best as a large group of volunteers, um, but to please filter life-threatening requests through official channels. So um, uh, this privatization of rescue is being, is being managed um, in concert with um, government uh, and official state bodies. Um, So in some accounts of the uh, work of the Cajun Navy, uh, the brotherhood of interstate survivors is forged through the shared experience of dispossession. While some rescue volunteers frame the labor of private disaster rescue as a means of shoring up an extended family, others narrate these selfless acts as mainstays of Cajun cultural identity. Uh, another member of the Cajun Navy proposed that his compulsion to rescue strangers could be chalked up to his Southern upbringing. It's just the way we were brought up, he says, you help your neighbor. In this observation, the private rescuer downplays the heroism of his actions at the same time he naturalizes the humanitarian desire to help others. As with fishing vessels commandeered by the Cajun Navy, Consumer drones, the latest iteration of rescue vehicles, similarly convert the recreational play afforded to private citizens into socially beneficial skills to be volunteered in disaster conditions. 
Like the Cajun Navy members, drone operators express a communal desire to provide assistance to those trapped in emergency situations, even as the state supplies support from the skies. So speaking in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, for example, uh, one pilot said, I knew there were airborne emergency operations going on in Houston as we speak. But I also know there was a whole community of drone operators ready to coordinate with local authorities to aid in whatever way we can. These stories of public private rescue configurations happen against a broader economic backdrop in which recreational practices have become increasingly indistinguishable from profitable enterprise. This sort of blurring occurs in a story entitled Drone Company Saving Lives in Louisiana Flood. This observed that a drone photography company located in Louisiana posted a message on their Facebook page offering to fly over and photograph the neighborhoods of unaccounted for loved ones and was swiftly inundated with messages requesting assistance. Desperate requests to check on buildings, animal shelters, senior communities and cemeteries where loose coffins have been seen floating down flooded streets are being posted to and responded to. The discursive character of this communal response expressed by private sector drone operators in these instances harkens back to a masculine white working class narrative of self-reliance um, that has cropped up in other communities within the US that have grappled with problems of responding to natural disasters. Um, I'm thinking here of the writing of John Krasowski uh, who has um, written on the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy in the Rockaways in New York. Um, he points out that stories of self-sufficiency and entrepreneurship are the keynotes of neoliberal response to extreme weather in the US, and that the way these traits become associated with nostalgia for a simpler time in America allows tropes of self-reliance to function not as an anxiety-provoking anxiety response um, to contemporary problems, but as a soothing recollection of yesteryear's joys. In much the same way, stories of disaster rescue in the South turn to the consumer drone, not as a cutting edge technology, but as a new humanitarian tool with which to act out a familiar script of overcoming physical perils to achieve communal self-sufficiency in the fate of mounting structural inequality. So part three, eco, citizen eco-sensing can undermine drone myths. Um, and I really, uh, in, in this um, section, want to sort of highlight that I think this is, this is uh, an area that is ripe for more study. Um, I wanna contrast the powerful and pervasive narratives of heroic private drone operators that I just discussed uh, with a different use of drones in flood conditions. So in this section, um, Drones used for citizen eco-sensing of uh, flood conditions don't lead to the rapid deployment of public resources. As a rejoinder to the life-saving discourse of the drone, the heroic drone operator, citizen eco-sensing from above does not apprehend an authoritative view that unifies uh, the sites from below. Um, instead, it can document widespread infrastructural failure and devastation caused by the absence of public welfare. So today, still moving aerial images of flooding posted by private individuals have become something of an emergent genre on social media platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. For example, in the case of the floods in southern United States in 2016, anyone with access to the internet um, can see flood images by searching hashtags like Louisiana flood 2016 or hashtag flood 2016. Within the digital media milieu, uh, YouTube user and drone operator Dev Nall successfully transmitted images of the catastrophic local flooding to the world via video upload on YouTube. Over several consecutive days in August of 2016, Devnall became an eco-sensing citizen subject when they shot a series of amateur videos with a consumer drone that captured aerial footage of the catastrophic flooding in and around Livingston Parish, uh, east of Baton Rouge near the cities of Denham Springs and Springfield. 
Um, and I just wanted to include this map so you kind of can get a sense of where Livingston is um, relative to New Orleans. So New Orleans um, is in the um, in Orleans County, which is um, down into the uh, southeast of Livingston. So if a lot of uh, national media attention um, is centered on um, the urban space of New Orleans, then you can see that um, Livingston being a little bit um, outside the city limits uh, is going to receive less attention. Again, another reason it's so interesting to see um, citizen footage. So given the lack of national news footage showing the devastation um, by people who live in Livingston, Devnall's videos provide important visual evidence of the unprecedented flooding experienced in rural Louisiana. Um, Devnall's uploaded videos also communicated more than changing water levels. Thanks to the drone's elevation and the parish's flat rural landscape, the vid videos also visualize the collapse of terrestrial transportation and communication networks at an infrastructural scale. Um, so uh, Devnall's videos are um, moving images and uh, you know, just to make sure that um, everybody can see the images clearly, instead of embedding the videos, I've included screen captures, um, but I'll try and explain what happens um, in and around the captures that I'm showing you. So uh, this one is from a video um, that dwells on spaces once occupied by automobiles. Here, uh, a drone hovers low, documenting a submerged parking lot and a strip mall uh, located on Route 12 in Jublin in Livingston. Uh, moving across the parking lot, the mobile camera will pan slowly over the water's surface. Um, and the shop names of the storefronts become easily legible. Bed Bath & Beyond, Ross Dress for Less, Shoe Carnival, PetSmart, and Lane Bryant. Parked trucks are scattered along the water's edge in this video. The drone's exploration of the mall not only monitors the flood's progress, but also evinces the ease with which the aerial camera navigates Route, 12, Route 12's newly aquatic environs, a feat impossible for vehicles confined to terrestrial modes of locomotion. The contrast between the presence of the drone and the absence of automobiles is pronounced. The uncanny appearance of the abandoned American strip mall offers a stark visual reminder of late capitalism's continued dependence on land-based transportation infrastructures to bring both goods and customers into brick and mortar stores. Devnall's video documents the fragility of the local system of, road, that, of roadways that rural southerners depend on to reach goods and services. So something like a change in weather pattern can expose the highway system, um, which becomes suddenly fragmented and the area's existing transportation infrastructures are shown to not be able to function um, uh, apart from within a very narrow sort of weather pattern. Um, in another video uh, still, uh, this one was posted the day before um, the mall one I just showed you. This one is entitled Louisiana Flood 2016 Springfield Highway 22. Um, trapped vehicles litter the landscape once again. From the drone's vantage, the muddy floodwaters transform the one, once uninterrupted farmlands into an impromptu island archipelago. Surrounded by water, um, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, uh, parked yellow school buses have become immobilized, confined to their schoolyards. Uh, at the bottom, towards the center, you can just make out five pixelated human shapes, a black pickup truck, uh, and a boat trailer um, on another island of land. Nearby, a spidering pattern of brown water marks out where roads once led and Devnall's drone rises and loosely tracks a broad expanse of this water through the trees. So obviously this is a um, submerged road that you can see going up the center. And this is a, um, a pulled back version of that. Um, but you can still see the pickup truck and the, the um, buses down into the left of the image. So this is taken from a, a sort of greater distance. Um, but what it shows, I think, is uh, the sort of pattern of telephone poles on the left-hand side of the 
um, the sort of waterway, which was once the roadway. Um, these peaking out of the water intermittent, intermittent intervals are the only indication that this was once a highway. Um, the repetition of the poles in the image testify, I think, to the materiality of Livingston Parish's existing terrestrial communication technology systems um, as they bend under siege of the water. The wires necessary to transmit electricity and telephone calls dip low under extreme environmental stress. The ecodrome thus provides a unique perspective, precisely because it does not rely on either telephone wires or roadways to connect to the world beyond the parish, it can transmit scenes of ruptured communication and transportation networks through media infrastructures of its own. Um, I should add this isn't always the case, right? Um, that, that oftentimes terrestrial uh, media infrastructures are um, very much a part of, of um, the kinds of communication that, that drones do. But here, I think that the contrast um, between the um, wireless drone and, and the wired uh, scene below is quite interesting. Um, Devnall's ecodrone functions as one component of a transhuman media infrastructure in this instance, a material formation that is going to include human and non-human agents uh, including the drone's operator, the camera, uh, the drone's rotors, as well as the computer, uh, internet cables, servers, uh, the atmosphere and the floodwaters. And this is, this is one of the places where I find that idea of the biophysical environment being part of infrastructure really uh, suddenly significant. Um, all of this together enables the circulation of ecological information at local, national and global levels. The contrast between this network and Livingston Parish's um, inundated local and national terrestrial networks is a stark one. What's significant, though, is that the failure to link up citizen eco-sensing through private networks with public search and rescue resources not only underscores a lack of government aid in such situations, it highlights the absence of the forms of heroic rescue uh, that we saw from the private sphere earlier. <clears throat> So um, final section of my talk today, um, the humanitarian drone, uh, humanitarian drone discourse as an imperial formation. So the tenacity with which the humanitarian drone discourse persists in churning out heroic rescue and life-giving properties situates both the figure of the heroic drone operator and the drone itself firmly into the US public's biopolitical imagination. Discourse surrounding the humanitarian drone routinely positions it as a mechanical agent tending to the biopolitical imperative to administer life, to advance what Foucault has described as the mandate to foster life or to make live. The implications of bestowing life-giving qualities onto domestic drones, given the broader geopolitical context of late US empire's reliance on lethal st drone strikes are many. To address them, one must adopt a broader historical view of eco-sensing drones via a media archeological approach. So in his account of earth observing media, communication scholar, Chris Russell, defines the dual use conception of media technology as an industrial policy that acknowledges the formative influence of military design and funding on technology. Um, things such as radar, sonar, automated computation and satellites, while suggesting that civilian and peaceful applications are just as likely as not. So while dual use technology can carry humanitarian promise uh, that open source and real time accessibility will generate social good for, from recording storage and processing capabilities, Russell also observes that these capabilities remain as unevenly distributed as ever. Karen Kaplan has pointed out that with respect to the daily, civil, the daily civilian use of geographic uh, information systems or GIS, 
uh, that for people in the United States, war is not elsewhere, but is in fact deeply imbricated in everyday life as a sort of military industrial media entertainment network. She contends that uh, as the uncritical use of military developed technology saturates contemporary culture and becomes normalized, so too does the militarization of citizens and consumer subjects of the United States. So this framing, I think, has powerful implications when it comes to appraising the influence that drones, uh, consumer drones wield as technologies discursively interwoven with the protection of life in times of environmental crisis. Such a view of unmanned aerial technology may be transposed into the arena of international warfare, where the lethal use of drones to carry out signature strikes and targeted killings have become emblematic of the US-led war on terror. As technologies of US imperial power, militarized drones consign untried individuals to death via the extra legal violence administered by the state's self-assigned power to decide who dies. For political philosopher, philosopher uh, Akila Mbembe, the logic that would kill others in order to maintain the life of one's own population describes the dark underbelly of Foucauldian biopower. Such a necropolitics, as he calls it, as Mbembe calls it, is often regarded by state actors as an extension, as an extension of the government's promise to make its population live. And I'm arguing today that this discourse, this sort of seesawing between um, biopolitical life making and necropolitical life taking, um, is now being rooted explicitly through this figure of the drone. In a theory of the drone, um, Gregor Chamiou has noted that the military drone has been conceived of as a humanitarian weapon par excellence. Um, so just to lay out what he means by that, um, he notes that by eliminating the possibility of a military life, that a military life will be lost in combat, proponents of uh, drone use in uh, military situations have argued that the drone adheres to the principle of vital self-preservation. Uh, in its accordance with this logic, says Shamayu, the drone can be said to be a humanitarian weapon. The humanitarian imperative is to save lives, and it does indeed save our lives. It is therefore a humanitarian technology. Um, so, so Shamu is really sort of focused in on the idea of US lives being saved um, through the use of drones. But I also want to acknowledge that a lot of uh, the discourse around military drones has to do with precision, right? So also this idea that somehow um, uh, collateral lives have potentially been saved by using this more precise weapon. Um, so in addition to all of that, um, I'm linking the discourse um, of the military drone as a technology um, to the domestic humanitarian intervention I've been talking about um, to expand the claim beyond the military sphere that Shamayu seems to limit it to uh, with this, this claim. In order to argue that this imperial thinking is actually saturating the US drone imagination both abroad and at home, um, both in the um, uh, foreign military case and in the, the domestic humanitarian one, that these are two sides of that same coin. So the discourse around the domestic eco-drone as an ostensibly humanitarian life-giving technology veils over its alignment with the geopolitical objectives of the US security state, which under the guise of war, of resistance, or of the fight against terror makes the murder of its enemy its primary and absolute objective. The domestic rise of consumer drones for eco-sensing and humanitarian purposes cannot be dissociated from the violence of the drone-assisted war on terror that carries on abroad. <coughs> to take drones seriously as biopolitical machines, as Lisa Parks and Karen Kaplan have called them, is to come to terms with the vitalizing element that courses through the cult cultural imaginary of the humanitarian drone as it is deployed across a range of theaters. In the end, attending to this cultural imaginary links together the discourses that frame the disaster rescuers unmanned aerial systems that are designed to rescue human life 
of those trapped by floodwaters. Um, and the wildlife conservationist unmanned aerial systems designed to preserve the lives of animals to the military's unmanned aerial systems designed to protect the lives of US citizens. <clears throat> so this analysis of humanitarian drone discourse and the infrastructures I've laid out here today makes clear, I think, that appeals to reframe the drone as a life-giving technology must continue to be carefully critiqued given the precarious lives in the US and abroad that hang in the balance. Thank you. Hi, sorry. Um, thanks a bunch. Thanks a bunch, Jen. That was really fascinating. I, I just had to attend to um, to an invading toddler um, just as you were finishing the talk. Um, it's me. Uh, if, if you heard the "it's me," that's that's Adrian saying hi. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I have uh, I have a bunch of of questions, um, and there's also some coming in on the chat. So. Um, what I might do is like I would, I might start off with one of my own, um, and then we'll and then we'll bounce over. Um, and I suppose it's a it's a broad question, which is about the otherwise. Like, is there is there hold on, Adrian? Um, is there an is there an otherwise for the humanitarian drone? Like under the framework and the discourse that you've set out, is is there an alternative? Um, possibility. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is sort of one of the one of the interesting overarching questions. Um, I think that uh, the thing I'm I'm sort of interested in is um, shifting what we mean by by drone. So shifting what we mean by human humanitarian drone. Um, to make sure that we're sort of considering um, the infrastructures that are are supporting it. Um, and when I'm thinking about an otherwise, I think that that otherwise has to include um, infrastructures that could, you know, that we could imagine existing outside of global capital. Um, so I do think it's a it's a tall order because I think in in some ways, um, uh, regardless of, of the purposes to which these, these drones are, are put, um, I'm just sort of mindful that, that it does seem like uh, there is a real sort of advantage to framing them as, as good or life-saving, right? That, that, that um, is something that I think we actually have to get out of, right? So I don't, I don't know if we can keep calling them humanitarian drones and have have an otherwise right um so it would it would sort of involve a, a systematic critique um of of the way that drones are embedded in society right rather than just thinking about um the drones on their own thank you i mean that's um i, I think that leads in quite well into a question from the chat from um Adam Fish, who asks, um, are there examples um, of the use of humanitarian or ecological drones that are not frameable by the four points that you've laid out? Like, are there things that exist outside this, um, this framework? Oh, um, yeah. So, I mean, my, my, I will say that the, the sort of research I was interested in was very much focused on the um, Southern United States and, and this particular case of, um, natural disaster and emergency responsiveness, right? Um, and I do, like, for example, I do think this, this idea of um, the heroic drone operator exhibiting, um, you know, sort of a, a white middle-class masculinist um, character is, is, you know, in a lot of ways, very much tied to American culture, right? So, so this is a very, um, uh, situated analysis, and I, I would expect that other other cultures might have different um, different ways of of thinking about or or framing um, some of this. 
um, you know, and I, I'm I'm thinking in particular that that there, you know, I I think I've seen examples of of drones being used um, to protect wildlife in this, and this is I should sort of um, also note that when I'm talking about the preservation of wildlife, um, I'm I'm drawing on work by Pooja Rangan who calls um, this this framing of animal welfare humanitarian intervention. So um, I'm sort of thinking about life across humanitarian and humanitarian humanitarian. So I wanted to introduce that, but but this sort of idea of um, protecting protecting animals um, can can often be um, sort of depicted in in maternal terms, right? Um, that 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 can sort of be gendered um, quite explicitly as a as a kind of care labor. Um, and so I think that, uh, yeah, that there, there are certainly going to be um, situations. Um, I'd be really curious to hear, hear um, other situations that are coming to mind for people in the chat um, about, about other ways that humanitarian drones um, are being depicted. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think that uh, there are definitely going to be examples outside of this, but these were sort of my initial, my initial thoughts about, about the ways that um, drone use for humanitarian purposes in the Southern United States anyway, is sort of um, doing the work of shoring up um, neoliberal ideas about, you know, self-enterprising individuals. Um, it's doing the work of um, propping up the heroic uh, drone operator, right? Um, and, and I wanted to contrast that with some of what I'm seeing in the primary sources, right? So, so the very fact that we have these amazing YouTube videos, I think, um, they're, they're, and that's why I sort of said that they're a, they're a resource for us because I think we don't quite understand, you know, there's something very like post-apocalyptic about them, um, which would seem to sort of challenge a lot of these popular myths we get about, about the kind of um, uh, ways drones can save us. So um, yeah, so I do think that, that probably outside of this context, there are um, other, other framings that would be um, important to consider too, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's, it's a really interesting question, I think, and, and this is like, sort of versions of this com uh, question are, are conversations that Adam and I have had, um, actually, um, uh, over, over some time now. And um, I think, you know, uh, one, one interesting example would be um, organizations like We Robotics, um, who are, uh, you know, they're based in, based in, um, uh, I want to say Switzerland. Um, and, but they're working with groups like local groups on the ground, um, throughout the global South, mostly throughout the global South. Um, and, you know, they have a, like, what is a fairly traditional developmental model in some ways, but like applied to, applied to drones as a kind of like, you know, new business kind of, uh, mix mm -hmm. of different, different things that people can do. Right. And, and, um, in, in many ways, like the work that they're doing is, is, um, uh, very optimistic, you know, and it has, and it has like this, this kind of positive charge to it. And they certainly see their work as like empowering and, and, um, and building capacity and so on. And I think it's a really interesting question about like, um, you know, how much that's the case and, uh, and then how much things can be both at once perhaps, which is part of problematic systems, but also, um, really helpful, um, uh, technologies and and opportunities for um, communities uh, in the, on who you know might be um, lacking in certain ways and so you know like yeah I mean you um, is it ideal maybe not but perhaps there are um, uh, some positives there as well and I think and so I'm sort of struck in some ways like it's really hard I think in um, drone studies research in general, um, although it really is starting to change to step outside of a, a framework that is dominated by like uh, the um, American imperial framing, yeah. right? Um, it's, it's, it's actually difficult to do. And like, and if that's your object, if that's your objective analysis, that's like totally fine, right? But like there, um, you know, I could say that when I started thinking about a lot of this stuff, I was sort of reflect, reflexively imposing those, those same frameworks. And it does require that sort of situated approach um, to, to, to begin to think outside them. 
Um, so um, yeah, also um, in the in the uh, in the in the chat, um, Aaron DeRosa has asked um, uh, if you've encountered moments in which this pivot towards the drone as humanitarian has changed the kind of military or security state drone discourse. So has the kind of yeah does the humanitarian drone shift the military drone discourse? I suppose. Yeah. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Uh, nice to see you. Um, so um, yeah, I think I think that's a that's such a good question um, because I think that I've been I've been tracking um, like the opposite dynamic, right? So I've been I've been really curious. Um, about the ways that um, uh, domestic domestic cultures are sort of revealing um, the traces of um, U.S. imperialism, uh, and I think that that we can we can flip it um, in the case of uh, this this pivot to the humanitarian drone, um, changing the the military um, and security state. Um, drone discourse, I'm thinking, for example, of the way uh, that drones have been used on the US-Mexico border um, as a, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, like it's, it's, it's so um, sort of frightening and, and fascinating to see the way uh, the US state talks about um, the project of securing that border. Right. Um, so this idea that um, securing the U.S. border is going to, um, in turn, benefit the lives of Americans, right? In a in a very sort of like material way, right? And and in that case, there's sort of this this idea that um, uh, there's this sort of like racist racist idea that we need to. Um, uh, keep um, keep others out of the country in order to to protect the like jobs of people within the United States. But there's something really interesting there, I think, in the way that that language around protecting the U.S. Mexico border um, it's very much uh, indebted to um, you know military ways of looking, military militarized ways of of tracking bodies, right? But it's all being sort of explicitly um, spoken about in terms of this idea that that um, there's uh, a sort of interest in civic well-being at the end of the day, right? So this this is maybe a bit of a, a bit of a shift in the way we think about humanitarianism, but I think I'm I'm interested in that, right? That there's this there's the sort of dramatic versions of um, humanitarian uh, humanitarian rescue, right, where, where the well-being of, of humans is sort of front front and center as a matter of life and death. But I do think that um, the U.S. does use this idea of um, the well-being of American citizens, right, in, in sort of maybe less dramatic ways, right, like your ability to make a living, your ability to, to sort of have a job um, as a a thing that the security state is actively working um, to preserve and protect for you um, through the militarized securing of the borders. So um, I think those. I think there's a there's a interplay there that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I would add too that uh, that the the military discourse around drones, at least once they become kind of public. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, shortly after the war on terror is is in some ways a humanitarian one to begin with uh, around, you know, a continuation of, of rhetoric of precision um, and, mm -hmm. you know, surgical accuracy and so on. And, um, and of course, yeah, a protection for, um, you know, US um, soldiers, like US soldiers will now not be risked. Um, right. and, and also win-win, um, you know, will be more accurate and there'll be less collateral damage and so on and so forth. Um, so that I th yeah, I think they're I think they're deeply interconnected in in lots of ways that's uh, yet to be teased out. Um, I want to pick up uh, um, a, qu a question from earlier from um, Catherine um, Brimblecombe Fox in the in who's who said, um, "Do you think that the term dual use um, is embedded in traditional notions of military operations that actually disguise the potential 
militarizability of all signal reliant drones um, and other tech. So do, I guess, do, um, uh, does this, does the, the, the language that the drones have this um, dual um, civilian or dual humanitarian military use kind of uh, lift up the drone um, in a way that kind of hides or obscures perhaps the way so many technologies are actually readily militarizable, like they or, or come from the military or could, could rapidly be converted to or, or used as tools of surveillance or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it does seem like um, uh, it, it does seem like there's that these technologies, there's something sort of um, interesting about trying to uh, parse their relationships to their own histories of becoming, right? So I think that there's something um, interesting there about the um, the way that um, yeah, that that it's it's that you have to sort of perform this kind of like back formation to like go back to early sort of like DARPA funded projects in order to sort of find the military Terrorization of technologies when I think, um, you know, like you, you can also perform that kind of analysis through other means, right? That the, um, you can imagine this sort of uh, militarizability um, that Catherine's um, talking about as, as um, you know, sort of like a, like um, a, a feature or a, a formation that's, that's latent in a lot of our technology. And again, I think that's just a product um, too of, of um, like global capitalism and, and the sort of search for markets, right? Um, if, if it's unregulated, then it's, it's not clear um, why a company wouldn't, right, sort of seek to expand um, its applicability, applicability across markets, including the military industrial. Um, one so mm -hmm. yeah um maybe there's some connections to the next question which comes from my um friend and colleague tara mclennan um tara's asked um it'd be interesting to hear more about the ways that media archaeology um, archaeology connects to the history of consuming the land for profit so how would you say this mediated gaze from above speaks to the ways we consume the land in this moment and what does this say about the trajectory of visual communication uh, sorry visual consumption um, of landscapes. And um, Adam adds on top of that, um, uh, what do the drone companies get for privatizing um, conservation, um, which, I, which, you know, has a, has, has a related question around, um, around consumption. Yeah, no, these are, these are sort of great questions that, that are, um, um, have become uh, really interesting uh, to me, I think, as I've pursued this um, line of inquiry. So um, I initially started thinking about the uh, drone uh, in domestic settings uh, as part of my, my work. And, and one of the things I sort of realized is that I had two projects, that one project was very much invested in um, uh, unpacking the way that, that femininity, um, a, certain, a certain kind of, of 21st century entrepreneurial feminism, but also conventional notions of femininity um, are, um, you know, propping up and also being perpetuated by um, contemporary U.S. imperialism. But the other thing that started happening in this project, right, is that, that I found cases, right, where femininity obviously isn't sort of um, central to them, right, like this, this talk today being one of them, but that nevertheless had to do with the domestic use of drones and that's still related in really sort of fascinating ways to um, imperialist projects, I think, right? Like through through the sort of um, uh, discursive uh, project of making live in this case. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, so in addition to thinking about the particular case um, that I shared with you today, uh, I've also um, been very interested in um, 
uh, what Tara talks about, this sort of idea of consuming the land for profit by thinking about um, the way the gaze participates in thinking about um, land and um, the environment as uh, extractable. So um, in this case, I'm thinking about things like the um, Dakota Access Pipeline um, and the uh, aluminum industry. And more recently, I've been interested in the uh, um, hydropower of uh, dams. Um, and one of the things that uh, I'm thinking about uh, is that this, this idea of um, look, using the mediated gaze of the drone and, and the consumption of the land or, or the idea of extraction is I actually think that, that drones in, in some ways are not only, you know, something we should think of as a, as a surveillance infrastructure, but, but something we should think of as, as a component of the extractive infrastructures. Um, and, and here I'm thinking like quite specifically, like I'm, I'm still like doing this research, but um, in, in Ontario, Canada, for example, uh, oil pipelines are monitored by drone, right? And the thing that's interesting about that, uh, and, and these, these private companies are very careful about it, but what they're talking about is um, protecting the pipelines from, um, you know, I guess, I guess forms of like natural degradation, but also uh, vandalism, right? And a, a similar sort of language gets used in India when, when um, uh, power companies are talking about the way that uh, drones are, again, helping monitor these um, extractive uh, infrastructures and, and one of the things that they talk about is that the um, the drone and its surveillance capabilities are very handy um, to find people who are poaching electricity <laughs> from the system right and so so there is really a sort of like consolidation um, I think uh, when you think about the way a way the mediated gaze of of the drone turns back into its sort of surveillance self, which is to say like starts looking for people, right? And um, in its its project of looking for like vandals or thieves, right? It turns once again into a kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of like a, a, a way of um, stabilizing and, and perpetuating class divisions. Um, and so you you do get this idea of um, uh, capitalists um, hoarding, conserving resources, right? And then parceling that out to consumers. Um, and so I'm really, uh, yeah, I'm really interested in, in this conversation about um, the way that um, consuming the land for profit is developing in relation to our surveillance technologies, because I, I think that it's actually m much more complicated than I initially, <laughs> that I initially thought. And I'll just sort of like tag on to this at the end to say that I think like part of what's fascinating about um, the, the case of um, drone humanitarianism and public rescue uh, for me is the way that it's also extracting um, human emotion. Right. So in the case of the of the drone um, operators, they've ex extracted labor, right? That the the state, uh, rather than have the state sort of like handle that work, um, you've taken time um, and money away from from people who now sort of volunteer that. Um, and I think uh, just to answer Adam's question about the the privatizing uh, what do drone companies get for privatizing conservation? I think that um, uh, another case I'm really interested in is the, uh, as I sort of mentioned, is, is the, the use of um, private companies going into uh, public lands in Africa in order to um, help with poaching. <laughs> um, that's, that's part of the project. Um, I think that, that at a sort of larger scale, if we zoom out, um, I'm interested in the idea of what's called natural security. 
um, which is just to say that that the U.S. government, um, I think, two two years ago, maybe two summers ago, had a sort of explicit um, uh, conversation um, with uh, private companies, private technology companies, um, in order to argue that securing um, uh, animals in Africa is important to US state security. And, and the sort of backstory of that argument is that um, uh, animal poaching, particularly the idea of um, uh, ivory and the ivory trade in, in Africa um, is going to fund terrorist organizations. So there's a sort of interesting uh, connection there, right? But if we, if the idea being that animal conservation is necessary to pr preserve um, uh, U.S. security, so there's very like self-interested um, things going on there. In addition to obviously um, uh, opening markets, opening new markets for for you know really like a number of startups on the west coast of America have have sort of infiltrated. Um, this this space of conservation um, in Africa, and you have to think about like, you know, how is how and why is that happening? So, mm -hmm. yeah, those are great questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I was thinking um, as you were talking as well about um, <clears throat> they're not all images from drones, but but Edward Batinsky's um, photography of of extractive landscapes um, and the mm -hmm. way he kind of uses the view from above. And uh, there's a kind of unsettling tension in, in those images because in a certain, like on the one hand, um, Batinsky's work shows us the scale um, mm -hmm. of environmental devastation. And on the other hand, um, there is, uh, it, it, it is interesting to be positioned in that, in that um, seemingly omniscient view from above as the point of critique. Um, and in some ways, like he is extracting, he extracts the aesthetic um, from um, from the the ruin of of of, envir of the environment, and of course, like it is meant to be, um, you know, uh, raising awareness and increasing kind of um, activism and understanding and so on around um, uh, around the uh, climate change issues. And I think, but I think that 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 is this unsettling tension with the drone and its and its use. Um, and it's used in activism because it clearly does have, you know, there are loads of cases of, of, of it having a kind of surveillance um, capacity or a aestheticizing capacity that can be really powerful in terms of, in terms of critique. Um, but yeah, how we, how we reckon and with and resolve those kinds of tensions is a difficult question. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, just finish with one more question um, that uh, Chris Agius has asked in the in the chat, which is that um, you know she says that she's really glad to hear more about um, a gendered take on all of this, and especially the idea of maternalism and animals. Um, mm -hmm. And how far can we take that analysis when applied elsewhere? And she's thinking of things like domestic policing, UN peacekeeping, and and so on. Um, and, and just noting that, you know, how liberal feminism um, returns us to a militarized um, approach in so many different contexts. Yeah, I mean, I'm, this is, this is uh, work that I've been doing for a while that I, I completely think needs to be um, explored because it is such a, such a rich site. Um, yeah, so I, for me, um, gender is, gender and femininity in particular are really driving a lot of um, what I think is happening. And I'll just pick up on, on one of the threads that she mentioned. I, I, um, I'm very much interested in, in this idea of um, uh, home security systems, right? And the way that, that drones, for example, um, have, have like now aligned themselves. Uh, this just came out, I think with, with Amazon, right? But this idea of a drone that's going to go through the interior of your house and sort of- um, The ring drone. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so there's there's um, right there's the the camera that sits at your front door, and now there's a sort of like floating camera that's going to um, stop intruders. And you know, for me, obviously, uh, I think it's important to recognize that these are technologies designed to um, secure a certain insulated vision of domestic space, right? Um, uh, this sort of idea that that this should be something that is 
um, separate from the world outside, um, that this should be a, a space where, um, you know, the heteronormative family can sort of reside and be buffered from the world. But I, I do think that you can't, you can't extract that idea of sort of protecting the domestic sphere um, without thinking about these technologies of home surveillance um, as anything other than extensions of the, the racist US carceral state, right? Because we know things like, like and Simone Brown has said this, but things like um, the ring drone um, or the ring, the ring surveillance technology that watches um, your front door is a, is a technology that um, uh, has been uh, made available to police departments, right? So police departments can get access to those, those videos. Um, I've, I've asked uh, uh, for confirmation that those, the videos of the, uh, the drones that are going through the interior of the home, um, whether or not those are also being made available to police, um, but there's no reason to think that they, they wouldn't be either right now or in the future. Right. And so you, you do have this, this, um, this really, you know, uh, pervasive way that, that this idea of um, uh, the carceral, the U S carceral system has just completely wrapped itself up with, with the domestic sphere in the 21st century, right? Like those, those two things really have started to mutually reinforce one another. And so, um, yeah, like to, to me, it's, it's completely, um, it's completely sort of gendered in the sense that there's an appeal to a sort of white femininity as the, the thing that's being um, secured and, and protected when we're thinking about what those uh, home surveillance systems are up to, even though that's not necessarily explicitly stated, it's all almost always implied um, in the way the way those um, products are sold. So yeah, that's a great question. We're basically out of time, um, but um, uh, so I'll leave this as a kind of rhetorical um, rhetorical question that that. Tara's pose, which is and which is then what does it mean to have this visual disconnect from having one's feet on the ground, a view that breaks away from the phenomenological experience of the human body? Um, and I would say that, you know, for me, and, and I, I suspect for you and, and uh, for a number of people who are tuning into the talk, that that question is, is one of the, the overarching things that drives our interest in this, um, in this particular um, technological infrastructure or media infrastructure. Um, so Thanks, everybody. We'll have to leave it there. And we're, we're already actually a little over time, which I think speaks to the richness of um, Jen's talk and also um, the fantastic questions and discussion. Um, please do come along to others in our Drone Futures series. There's two more of them. Uh, the next seminar is at 10 a.m. Uh, Sydney time on Wednesday, the 4th of November. We're going to be joined by Thomas Stubblefield, whose new book, Drone Art, offers a compelling account of the ambivalence of art that takes up or responds to drones. And then to finish up the series, we have Marwish Chishti, um, one of the most exciting artists working against drone warfare, and she's going to be talking about her work. Um, you can register now for both of those talks. You just have to follow the link uh, below the video. Um, and speaking of following, um, if you're on uh, Twitter, you can find me at, uh, at Richardson underscore M underscore A um, and the Media Futures Hub at, at Media Futures Hub. And you can follow Jen at JD, is it underscore or just JD Schnapp? Underscore. JD, see the best people have underscores. <laughs> JD underscore Schnapp. Um, if you like this talk, please do spread the word. The link you're using now will become a regular YouTube video and we'll be releasing this talk along with a separate interview on the Media Futures Hub podcast. Uh, and there's a link to that in the video description too. And uh, please do subscribe to the podcast and to our YouTube channel. Subscribe to everything uh, if, if you like what we're doing. Um, thank you, Madeline, for moderating the chat. And thank you, Jen, for a wonderful talk. And thank you all for tuning in for this virtual seminar in the Drone Futures series and offering really such fantastic um, questions. Stay safe, everybody. Stay strong and uh, take care of yourselves and one another. <laughs>